There's a third light like, switch. Yeah. And then maybe shut off one of the other ones. Yeah. Flip that one back just on. This one, just yeah, and then flip yeah. off. The... Oh, I see. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> better. Your choice. <laughs> Somebody control it. I don't know. Okay, is it um, a good time to start? Okay, well, Raj asked me to give, to give us this lecture, and um, um, specific uh, instruction to give is that not no mess. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for um, and also I, I'm trying to summarize the, some of the key physics behind MR. In one lecture, so um, I hope I'm not making some people who come here for more rigorous, uh, you know, MR physics disappointed. But um, hopefully, give you a, at least a flavor of what's behind. Okay. Uh, by the way, my name is Jian Hui Zhong. I I'm, I was trained as a physicist, but I, now I'm working in a in medical school in a imaging sciences, which is uh, formerly radiology. I also have Bowman in physics and uh, BME. Okay, so this is what I plan to do. I plan, I plan to give you some very, very basic ideas behind MR, which is really the nuclear spin physics. That's what we're dealing with, okay? Then I'm going to have some very brief, brief introduction about how spins, which is in nuclear spins, which is in nuclei, how they interact with the magnetic field, in particular with the three different types of magnetic field, with a static magnetic field, with a radio frequency magnetic field, and also with the field gradients. How the interaction of nuclear spins with those fields leads to the fancy MR images, like what we see on the wall here. Um, then I'll give you some very brief uh, introduction about nuts and bolts behind the machine of MRI. Um, well, not just machine, but you know, there's hardware, but also there's what we call the power sequences. And there's also a whole series of uh, physics behind explaining what we see and what we detected as image, or, or in more uh, specifically, how the image contrast give us information about what we see. Uh, for most of you, if you're interested in brain. OK, so here's um, a very, very brief uh, introduction of what's behind MRI. MRI, in a nutshell, is based on a technique called NMR, or nuclear magnetic resonance. Well, the reason it's called NMR is that, first of all, it's dealing with the properties we're looking at in the nuclei of every system. Can anybody tell me the level of construction at the microscope level? Where everybody, everything, every, every, everything in the world is consists of molecules. What's below molecules? 
atoms. Okay, good. Um, what consists of atoms? Right, electrons and the nucleons. Okay. In fact, both electron and nucleon has what we call the spin, and both spin can interact with a, with a magnetic field to generate a signal. But in MRI, we, we deal in particular interaction of nuclear spin with a magnetic field. So it's nuclear and it's magnetic because interaction is between nuclear spin and a magnetic field. And the way we detect signal is called resonance. Resonance in general sense means that it doesn't happen in, in all range of values of parameters, but it happened at a particular you know, point, in this case a particular frequency. So it's a, it's a resonance phenomenon as we will see. And it's dealing with a specific energy transfer at a particular <coughs> radio frequency. So MR essentially is using this technique called nuclear magnetic resonance, but only in the 1970s and 80s, MR began to translate, transform into MRI, and I stand for imaging. Uh, of course, this is natural because now we're not just dealing with uh, you know, a, a measurement in a test tube, we're dealing with people, and we're forming images with this technique. But also we drop N because N is nuclear is all, always related with uh, a nuclear bomb and that kind of thing and people generally don't have very good uh, impression about it. So we, we say, well, we just don't say it, even though we're dealing with a nuclear. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's MRI or MR sometimes. Of course, um, um, of all the nuclei or all molecules in the world, uh, some of them can actually give us a mass signal. I have a list of, sig of uh, symbols here which all come from the body. In our body, we have uh, protons, but we also have carbon, have oxygen, fluorine, sodium, and potassium, and, uh, and phosphorus and potassium others. Okay, all this potentially can give us signal. Okay, what is important is the number on the, on the top left corner here, because that's a number is for the, for the total number of protons and the neutrons inside a particular nuclear. Okay, you often hear people saying phosphorus 31 spectroscopy, or proton 1 imaging, or, or proton you know, H1 imaging because not all the nuclei can give us MR signal unless this particular number there has a specific meaning. In this case, it's odd number. There's unbalanced nucleon and the protons inside the nuclear that can give us a signal. For example, oxygen. Normally, it's oxygen 16, okay? That's equal number of protons and neurons, and that doesn't give us MR signal. Only oxygen 17 give us signal. So, so that's why in oxygen 17 MR image, you actually have to inject isotopes of oxygen. Okay. Anyway, that's just so you know that not just proton can give you a signal, other can give you, but there is under certain conditions. Okay. Why, did, why does it have to be odd? Because you need a net nuclear moment to interact with the external magnetic field. Oh, okay. Otherwise, they cancel each other, oh, okay. right? Okay, so um, so in order to be I image, a nuclear must have odd number of neuro neurons and protons. I just, I just mentioned that already. And the second condition, it has to be abundant in the body because in general, MR is actually a very weak, very insensitive technique. You, we need a lot, okay. Luckily, H1 or proton is really a star of MRI because one, our body is mostly consists of water and each water molecule has two hydrogen atoms and each hydrogen atom has one proton. So there's a lot of protons in our body. So it's very abundant. It's a very high concentration in the human body. 
And also it turned out it's one with the highest mass sensitivity. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but, but just as you know that uh, proton MR yield largest detectable signal. In fact, it's not just a little bit larger, hundreds of times or thousand times larger than any other nuclei. So, so in fact, in 99% of human MI, we use proton uh, MR. And of course, in this course, you are dealing with just proton MR. But you should know that it's not only proton. Other, other image, other pro, uh, nuclear other and proton can be, can be imaged. But one signal is very weak, and secondly, they have a very different resonance frequency, and therefore need a very different hardware to do that. And most hospital MR machine, including the machine we have RCBI doesn't have that capability. So we deal with the proton MI exclusively. OK. Any questions? All right. Um, so let's just look a little bit behind how MI works. OK. People are very familiar with a, a small bar magnet. Right? When you have a, a small bar magnet, when you try to reach to the, a big magnet or a magnetic field, it, turns, it has a tendency to turn around until a lineup with the external magnetic field. Right? The reason for that is that in, internally, it has this, we call the current around it, which make, make itself have a different polarity, and that polarity, you know, when the polarity of that of the small magnet is the same as external one, they tend to expel each other. They tend to align each other when they are the opposite, right? Similarly, when we look at inside a proton, we have a, essentially the same thing. We have this thing have a tiny current go around it, and because of that, it generates a magnetic moment, and that tend to interact with the external magnetic field whenever it's put into external magnetic field. So when we have protons, we have this. And this kind of a current we cannot control. It's an intrinsic property of proton. It's, it's there all the time. Okay, So we cannot control. It's a, it's a property of nuclear itself. And also, it's property of the electron itself. So, behaviorally, it's just like a bar magnet. It will, when it's put into magnetic field, it will interact with the external field. And because this thing have current around this, and it's like it's spinning all the time, so it's called a nuclear spins. Okay. So. When it's put in the magnetic field, the situation is very similar actually to a, a mecha mechanic top. I don't know how many of you have ever played with this, you know, besides iPad or you know, <laughs> or, or, or computer games. But when we were young, we we had this kind of a toys, you know, which just spin around, and then you you sometimes use a whip, you whip it, and you keep rotating, even though it's a very pointing. It tends to fall down, but if it's spinning, stand up, right, and keep rotating. And very similarly, at the microscopic level, nuclear spin is doing the same thing. Okay, so as long as it's inside magnetic field, in this case, it's in a in a gravitational field or in a, in a gravitation field by the by the Earth. You know, spins will as long as it's rotating, will keep stand along or. or rotating around, similarly, nuclear spin will do the same thing. Okay, What's the use of it? Well, <coughs> it turns out when we put this thing into the magnetic field, okay, it, will, it will be able to align up against, against external magnetic field or, or along the magnetic field, depending on how much energy you give to it, just like how fast you whip the, 
your, your tops. Okay, if you give it particular field, because this is nuclear spin is a quantum mechanical property, so it doesn't absorb energy at a, with an arbitrary amount. It has to absorb, absorb energy particular amount, so it go from a low energy state or to higher energy state. When you use radio frequency signal into the spin system, the spin will absorb particular energy if it satisfies certain conditions. Okay, in this case, a particular frequency. Okay, if it satisfies particular frequency, the nuclear spins will go from lower energy state to higher energy state. And after you take out the radio frequency, then things tend to go down from high energy state to low energy state, right? Because in this process, it's against nature to stand at a high energy state. So it will spontaneously returning to the low energy state. In that process, it will actually give away the energy it is absorbed in the excitation state. And that energy as giving away can be detected, and that's our MR signal. Okay, so from quantum mechanic point of view, this energy absorption and energy emission, but the key point is this number tend to be a very fixed number. That number is not an arbitrary number. For proton, there's a particular frequency. For carbon-13, there's another frequency. So the, the key point here is that this kind of energy excitation is caused by RF pulse. And when our pulse is, is taken away, the energy will be emitted, and that emitted energy can be our signal, which can be used for form MI image. Okay, so that particular, particular frequency is called normal frequency. Okay, even though I was warned, no mass, no all that, but I, I think this is just a very simple symbol, right? All you need to know is that MR, this R is resonance. Resonance is corresponding to a particular frequency, and this frequency is a normal frequency. Okay. And that frequency is very important because all electronics are built around that particular frequency. For people, for people who have some background of electronics, you know that uh, you know, a lot of behavior depends on very, very strongly on which frequency you are using. Right? If your TV are not tuned to a particular fre frequency, you don't get that TV signal. If your cell phone doesn't have a right frequency, you don't get that cell phone signal, right? Same thing here, if you don't have a right frequency, you don't get your MR signal, right? Okay, talking about this energy, high energy and low energy, you know, the corresponding to either spin goes al along the magnetic field or against the magnetic field, and this is actually not very unusual either. You know, imagine you have a, a doorknob that's connected here, but it's only one connection. Usually you have two connections, right? But if you have only one connection and this connection is loose, then what happened? When you flip up, it tend to fall down. You flip up, it tend to fall down, right? So this is a two energy, energy state example in nature. Things tend to go to low energy state. That's how things works in, in naturally in, 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 in natural world, and that's all how it works here. Spins tends to go to low energy state, and during that process, we we can get our signal. That's we shall see. Okay. So, again, to summarize, we have the nuclear spins. We have all this, but we have lots of them. Yeah, because. You know how many how many molecules in each one centimeter cube of water? It's something like a ten to twenty three, right? So do you have that many water molecules, and each one has two protons, so it's double that amount. So you can imagine the MS image. You have voxel size, say one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter. There's still a whole lot of nuclear spins, and they tend to interact with each other. In most cases, when there's no magnetic field, some point up, some point down in different direction, but they they don't have a coherent 
alignment, so therefore there's no magnetization. However, when you put in them into magnetic field, the same spins, you know, some still go up, some still fall down, but on average, you have more spins in low energy state than high energy state. Okay, so this is so-called a polarization process. Once you put something into magnetic field, spin will polarize, and on average, it will give you more spins along one direction than other direction. So potentially, you have a signal there. However, this process is actually very fast. For, for example, in my experiment, you shift your subject into magnetic field. That probably take a, a few seconds for the subject, the spin inside the head of the subject to align up with the magnetic field. But after that, it's all static. There's nothing happening. Okay. So obviously, we need other ways to excite signal and, and the detect signal. So again, it's this normal equation. The frequency we're detecting in my experiment is proportional to the magnetic field we use. Okay, so it's directly proportional to it. And that has a lot of consequences. One of them is that if we plot our resonance frequency against magnetic field, then we have a, a perfectly linear relationship. Okay, so for example, if this is 1.5 Tesla, which has resonance frequency around 63.8 megahertz, then double the field with double the frequency. Okay, why we care about that? Because the signal itself is proportional to magnetic field. In other words, the higher the field, the more signal we can detect. Okay, so there's an obvious high field advantage. That's why one of technical development in the field is push for higher and higher magnetic field strengths, because higher strengths means higher signal. Higher signal means you can do more things with a smaller voxel size, therefore high, re high resolution of image, or you can do imaging much faster, so you can have less accurate detection time, so you can do look at a dynamic process much faster, that kind of thing. So in the brain function of MI in particular, the trend is go to higher and higher field, and the, when the RCBI was built up in about almost 10 years ago, we decided to choose a three Tesla magnet in contrast to what the hospital use, which is 1.5 T, because of this reason. We want to get a better magnet with a higher sensitivity, with a better capability to detect things faster with a higher resolution, higher quality. So this is very important in, the, in this field. Of course, the drawback is that the higher the field, the harder it is to make the magnet, therefore the more expensive the magnet becomes. Okay, any questions? I sort of have a, a conceptual question, and I don't know if it's easy to answer or not. Um, okay, try, let's answer. try. Yeah. But how does, if you go to this, the slide right before this one, so how does the field strength, um, what is that relationship with the radio frequency pulse? So or maybe I'm just kind of confused. Well, this is frequency, what's the frequency? Frequency is just how fast right. those change. Okay, so it's pulse has a both frequency and the duration. Mm -hmm. So what is your question related with duration of the pulse, or is it related with the frequency of the pulse? Well, so with a three T, does that? So is the is the so it just changes the it just changes the amount of time that you're able to sample or that you're able to send the pulse. You can you, you can present well, it. Well, you can you can. You can think about this term that um, you know 1.5 t yeah. things go up and down, up and down like this, mm -hmm. and 3 t go up and down, up right. and down fast, right. twice as fast. Okay. Okay. I. I yeah. it, it not it doesn't necessarily directly bring you a better signal. Yeah. But, it, but in over in general, 
this is true. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, of course, MR doesn't come from from the blue. There are lots of work be before. In fact, this is one of the very active area in physics. Uh, you know, from 1920s. Okay. So from 20s to 30s, and all those people get Nobel Prize, by the way, for the work they did. Okay. All right. But but. Um, so the breakthrough comes from the 1945 when a uh, Stanford and a Harvard physicist to find that uh, this static and RF magnetic field of MR actually is very essential. This is the one I just talked about. You know, in 40s that's a Nobel Prize work. Okay. <laughs> okay. But but then from MR to MRI the breakthrough really comes in the 80s when when American physicists did a lot of work and. They, Euclid physicist Mansfield found that, in fact, if you use field gradient, then you can relate the information of MR signal from where it comes from. Okay, so it, it ha built direct relationship between the field field gradients and the location of a signal source. Therefore, allow you to image. So that's that's another breakthrough, and of course, for this group, what's also relevant is the discovery in nineteen nineties, so-called Bode effect, or level dependent effect. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about it. Okay. From from MR to MRI, really, just two works. One by Lotberg suggests the field gradients can be used to form image. In other words. You can use the relationship between the signal frequency and the location of the signal through this gradient. Okay, so th this third component of MR, besides static field, besides RF field, now now he introduced the gradient field that really built this link between the signal and the image. And the Mansfield additionally proposed a specific MR imaging technique that realize this kind of concept. Okay. Of course, uh, you know, this is a work first public in, published in Nature, of first image that Lodberg did with a mark, a form image, and he has two test tubes put into magnet, and here's the image of the two test tube. The way he did it is that he tried to rotate an additional magnetic field so that it will generate projections of signal in different directions. And when they reconstruct the image, so back projection, you get something looks like an image. Okay. But that's really the first MR image that's generated. Of course, today's image is much better than that. OK, another area that gets people very excited and in fact get this group of people excited is so-called functional MRI. Okay. Functional MRI really started in the 1990s when Ogawa or Bell Lab, Bell Lab first observed there is the effect called the Bold effect that relate the MR signal and the blood oxygenation state. Okay. And so he's the first one that detect this. And then several other people for further use improved the technique and actually show first experiment was done in rats. Then other people show that in humans there's such effect as well. In fact, you don't have to do go extreme like first experiment did to get a bold effect. Okay. So the first experiment is actually quite simple. There are two images here, okay? This is a rat brain, you know, sort of like a corresponding to human clonal slice. This is a live rat brain and a dead rat brain. Okay. What are the main difference you see? Besides it, 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 it's been mm -hmm. rotated and all that. <laughs> What's the difference? There's a lot of deterioration in the right one. Yeah. Well, the difference is that you see those dark rings, mm -hmm. right? Those, I think it's corpse growth in it. Okay, in a rat. Live, dead. Okay, so what you can say about it? 
What's the difference between life and death? <laughs> Cells are maybe doing something in the left one, and then the right one, they're not, because they're dead. Blood flow. Oxygen in the yeah. brain. There you go. Yeah. Okay. In one case, rat is breathing, so there's oxygen go into yeah. the brain. In another case, stop breathing, so there's no oxygen. So now we can all say that, but remarkably, it's a statement he made when he had this observation. He essentially is saying, well, the contrast, you know, this kind of contrast should have high sensitivity towards physiological change, which influences the level of blood oxygenation, and it could serve as quantitative detection tool for mapping regional blood oxygenation level in the brain. Okay, that was first he mentioned this blood oxygen level dependent effect. But it's also very brief and very bold statement itself. He think that just from this, he think he can detect a physiological change related with the brain activity. In fact, related with a lot of brain, you know, semantic sensory function or cognitive functions people prove it later. Okay. So anyway, so that's the that's the insight, that's really insight into the experimental results. Most people just say, well, life and death, of course it's different. But he made this observation and he actually made this published and then, you know, people still think if there's a next Nobel Prize for MR, this might be, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so that's first observation of bold effect. Um, did Raj actually go through this? Some nod, some shake. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. So uh, let me just go again briefly. Okay. So essentially, this bold effect is related with primarily the change in the blood, the oxygenation through the cortical area, through capillary bed of cortical area. A simple cartoon is that if you have input of blood, you know, through arterials and out of a vena, but in the between you have a capillary bed. Okay. And so the blood oxygenation is distributed through the area and all that kind of thing. Okay. So normally when when brain is in a normal state, the certain hemoglobin in the blood carry oxygen, other doesn't carry oxygen. So there's oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And the oxygenated hemoglobin tends is so called di uh, it so called diamagnetic material which means it has no net magnetization. So therefore, it has no effect to the surrounding magnetic field. Okay, so MR signal due to the oxygen hemoglobin tend to be high. And if we become deoxygen hemoglobin, then become paramagnetic, which means that it actually generate small field disturbance around the vessels, around the capillaries. Okay, so in that case, you can imagine now your, your signal, in addition to the external signal you put in, you also, it also sees this internal field which disturb its distribution. So that signal becomes smaller. So what happens is that, compared with this basal state to a state when brain's activated. See, when I'm speaking, when you're listening, or when you're seeing things, okay, the particular brain cortical areas have this change, have this extra demand for oxygenation and for metabolic flow. So as a net effect, you know, a normal brain will react in supplying more oxygenated blood. Okay, there's a, well, of course, related with that, there's a change in blood flow, there's a change in your oxygen, uh, hemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin concentration, there's a change in the cerebral blood volume, there are all kinds of things happening. But the net effect is that now you have a more uniform magnetic field and therefore have a less disturbance to MR signal. So the net signal will become larger. Okay. So a typical bold MR experiment is compare basal state or resting state with activated state. And you see the difference between those two states as a detection of your brain activation. Right? So that's shown here. You have one state of one, you have state two, and you subtract the two to get the functional map, right? 
so that's how it's done here. And of course, I simplify things a lot. You know, in reality, you need a, a lot of repeated measurements. You need to do a lot of statistical analysis to make sure the difference you see is real. It's not the noise. It's not due to the subject move. It's not due to a lot of things. So a lot of things are involved there to get this. However, the basic principle remains that you are looking at the difference of two different states. And because brain behaves that way, brain have this um, metabolic change there to relate to the brain activity. Okay. So that's how it's done. Right? Questions? So how many of you actually have done any functional model experiment? How many of you plan to do any functional experiment? So for the rest of you, while you're here. <laughs> OK, so, so that's a basic nuclear spin physics, and that's a basic uh, boat. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, every year there are thousands of papers, and there are probably over 30 books about functional MI published already. And each of them is like 500 pages. So, obviously, a lot in it, right? Uh, but hopefully, you get some idea, okay? Okay, um, so next, I'm going to go in a little bit deeper into actually how each component of MR works and how they look, how they work. Okay. Um, I mentioned already we have magnetic field and we have field that is either uniform, which is used to polarize spins, or have or have its its. Uh, varying with time, so it's radio frequency field that used to excite the signal, and then we'll have a linear gradient, which is used to encode spatial information with the signal source, right? Usually we use B0 to, to be the symbol for the static uniform field, uh, which is used for spin polarization. So. That is the big magnet you see when you go into MR room. Okay. That's, that's static, meaning that doesn't change as a function of time. We actually, we hope it's steady all the time unless magnet crunch or something, then, then that's a big job. Otherwise, it's sta steady, it's constant value, it's, it's uniform through the sample we are we're using. Then we have this, usually we call the B1 field or radio frequency field, which is used, used for signal excitation. Okay. I mentioned already, in quantum mechanics, it's very easy to understand that you have two energy state, you need a particular energy to pump spins into excited state, and then detect the, the relaxing of the spins from high energy state to low energy state. In, usually in the experiment, we have RF pulse, but RF, which means the field itself is time varying. It's a function of time, but also it's a very short burst of, of, the, of, the, of the field. So we use the coil to generate pulse, which allow the nuclear system to, to be excited. And then we look at, then we detect it. So usually our field is a pulse field. It's time varying, also it's short in time. Then we have so-called a gradient which means that if it's x gradient, then it will generate field in x direction, which change linearly with x direction. Okay. By the way, in a, in a very common convention, MR system, B0 is considered as z direction. Okay. So if you go into magnet room, you, you have seen the long ton tube. Okay. The axis of tube is z direction and the perpendicular is x and y direction. Okay, so field gradient can be either in x direction, y direction, or z direction. 
but essentially it now built relationship between the field and the spatial locations of the of the signal. Okay. Then if we have that information, we can decode that information to form image, which give us spatial location of the signal. Right? So that's that's what an image is. Image is something that has lo locations have coordinates. Right? And this gradient give you, give us that information. And overall we will have field that's summation of all those three magnetic fields. So it's interaction of nuclear spin with this three magnetic field that eventually give us a MR image. Right? So corresponding to that, the MR hardware is also designed with what we call the coils. And coils is the hardware that allow us to generate this three field. There are, coil, there are coils that generate B0 field. There are coils generate B1 field. There are coils generate gradient field. Okay. So each, of, each one of those corresponding to a, a physical set of hardware inside the magnet field, inside the mag magnet, magnet scanner, MR scanner. Okay. There are also some other supporting hardwares. For example, we actually have a, quite a few small magnets which help us to make this big B0 field more uniform. Okay, Because this B0 field, its pure function is to polarize all spins. And we, all, we want all spins to be polarized in a uniform fashion. Right. It shouldn't carry any information about where it comes from. So that, for, that field need to be very uniform, very homogeneous, and we use a whole set of small coil to make that happen. Of course, for, for human experiment, we also want, you know, for example, sometimes we monitor the pulsation, you know, the blood, blood pressure or you know, cardiac uh, pulsation, cardiac beat, and all kinds of things. So a lot of it phys physiological monitoring. And of course, MR is itself generates lots and lots of data. So a lot of computers are working together to support the data acquisition and data storage and which eventually data processing. Okay. And so there are a lot of other things. And also, for, for example, for patients, they are giving the video uh, uh, monitors for kids in the magnet. They can watch Disney movies or they can listen to music. Uh, so, so a lot of other accessories that uh, also allow, allow my experience to be a little bit more tolerable. Right? <laughs> I don't know how many of them have been to the inside the magnet. Wow. So you know how, how uncomfortable it is. <laughs> <laughs> so so you know, for, for brain function of MR study, we really need very motivated subjects. <laughs> So uh, one task of experimental is to communicate with subjects to convince them this is something you can do, something you can do well, and something important in your contributing. Because otherwise, you know, I don't want to be the man. <laughs> it's noisy, it's, uh, you know, so. but anyway. So just a bit of review of high school physics. How many of them have you ever learned this? You have a coil, have a current that goes into this, that generates a magnetic field. It's called a right hand rule, right? You have a current to go into this, you have a you generate a magnetic field. And conversely, if you have a magnetic field in this direction, then current is going to be generated along it. Okay. Um, but essentially that's how all the coils were done, okay? Imagine you, this is opening of your MR scanner. Okay. So what's, what you don't see are all, actually all kinds of coils going like this. Okay. Essentially, the, the coil will generate a magnetic field and as shown in the blue line here. Okay. But inside, it's large, uniform, B0 field. Okay. So this is essentially the configuration of this large magnet, except in this case, because we want to use 
we want to generate a very strong magnetic field. So the technique we're using today is using superconducting magnet. Okay. So inside this is opening. Outside here it's all sealed and it's cooled down to the 4.2 K or it's 273 negative uh, uh, degree. Okay. That keep everything cool down and keep the superconducting coil generate very large current which in turn generate very large magnetic field. Okay. So that's the static field and if you look at a, a picture of a typical MR scanner this is superconducting magnetic field and yet B0 field is, is going through there. Okay. For one Tesla it's 10,000 Gauss, and the Earth's magnetic field is about 0 0.5 Gauss. Okay, so today's MR uses very large magnetic field, much much larger than the natural magnetic field, and it's very strong. So it's very strong, and very costly because the technique involved in making this kind of magnet is actually very very complicated. In fact, a sad story is that today there's only one company in the whole world that can reliably making seven Tesla magnet. And the early last last year, the company decided to quit from the business <laughs> because it's too much for them. It's too costly for them. <laughs> so the whole amount community was very, very concerned about this development and there is still work going on trying to persuade the company to continue the, <laughs> the production of magnet. It's even though it sells for millions of dollars, but it's still too complicated and too much for the company to do. Okay. So, so why, so why do you need a seven Tesla magnet versus like a three Tesla magnet? Well as I mentioned in the beginning the yeah. The higher field really means higher signal to noise okay. ratio, means better detection of smaller object, of higher spatial resolution of okay. image, or fast acquisition of, of signal. All that, what we hope. Okay. And also because it's super conducting, so it's on all the time. That means